knows how you come across somebody once in a while you, you shouldn't have messed with. That's me. Well, I'm I am not an African American. You're Oreo cookie, white right in the inside and black on the outside. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. Talking that idiotic stuff you talk about, I will slap you. Go ahead, make my day. Black at the ace of spades, but 100, 100 percent American. Heard around the world by everybody and their mama. The Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show. Uniting the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We're also rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. The Second Amendment is under attack like never before in history. And I have to tell you, America, if you don't wake up and get involved, you're going to lose your right to bear arms. I have with me Dr. Uh, John Lott, Jr., economist, political commentator, and author of multiple books. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from UCLA. And I wanted to talk to him about all this His uh, and his brand new, his newest book, his brand new book, At the Brink, Will Obama Push Us Over the Edge? If anyone understands what's going on, Dr. Lott does. Dr. Lott, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I do appreciate you being here. Will Obama push us? Let me ask first, just for the folks to know a little bit more about you. Where do you stand on the Second Amendment? Well, I mean, I basically uh, don't talk about things in terms of the Second Amendment per se. To me, it's a matter of people's safety. And I think that yeah. uh, this is one place where freedom and safety go together. I think that, um, uh, you know, it's important that um, basically uh, there's two groups of people who I find in my research benefit the most from having guns. It's people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly, and people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime. And in our country, that tends to be one relatively well-defined group, and that's poor people, particularly blacks, who live in high-crime urban areas. And it'd be great if the police were there all the time to protect people, but the problem is if you go talk to the police, one of the first things that they'll recognize is that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crime's been committed. Exactly. raises the question about what people should do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves. And simply telling them, as we often hear, that people should behave passively uh, is simply bad advice. Uh, by far the safest course of action for someone to take when they're having to confront a criminal uh, is to have a gun. And there's lots of evidence on that, but I, I can go through it. But basically— um, Give us a couple of uh, evidence, examples of that. Well, there's something called the National Crime Victimization Survey, which— uh, has been surveying people for over 30 years. It's uh, They survey about 150,000 people each year. And it's amazingly detailed data because uh, in the survey, they'll ask people, uh, have you been victims of violent crime? Where did it occur? What time? Characteristics of the criminal, characteristics of the victim, uh, you know, what was the final outcome in terms of injury or death to others? And what you find consistently across different types of crimes is that by far the safest course of action for somebody to take is uh, uh, is to have a gun. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, we frequently hear is that passive behavior is relatively safer than active resistance. And there's a kernel of truth to it, but it's extremely misleading. If you look at all forms of active resistance lumped together— it's true that passive behavior is slightly safer, but the problem is you're lumping together all sorts of different types of active resistance. Some are much safer than passive behavior, and some are much more dangerous. So, for example, uh, by far the most dangerous course of action for someone to take, uh, and it's particularly true for women, uh, is to use their fists. Uh, you know, if a woman uses her fists uh, when she's confronted by a criminal, 
there's usually a large strength differential that exists there, and you're likely end up with serious injury or death yeah. to the woman. Yeah. Second, second most dangerous course of action for a woman to take is to run away. Now, obviously, if uh, this is on average, obviously if she can run away and escape, that's great. But the problem is, women tend to be significantly slower runners than men are, who are you, virtually always the type of violent criminal that you're talking about particularly young males who are the typical violent criminal. And so in the process of being tackled and subdued, um, you can end up having serious injury to the woman, and also it's likely to lead to additional violence. Yes. And it, so if you break those things down, you know, and, uh, there's like 10 different categories that they break them down into. What you find is that having a gun is much, much safer. It's about two point – women who behave – passively are about 2.5 times more likely than being seriously injured than a woman who has a gun. Why do you think that is so, I mean, just common sense, common sense. Why do you think most women are not in support of uh, gun ownership? Well, I think one of the issues that you have is that uh, just news coverage. I mean, you constantly hear about bad things that happen with guns and uh, almost never hear about the benefits. I mean, how many times have you heard stories on the national evening news about somebody using a gun in order to protect themselves, protect somebody else? Uh, you know, virtually never hear about those types of stories. Yes. Yet, on the other hand, they can recall without even trying what seemed like thousands of times uh, that they've heard n national news stories about something bad happening with guns. And I think that strongly affects people's perceptions about the costs and benefits of, of owning a gun. You also hear claims often in the media about the fact that uh, if you own a gun in the home, it's more likely to result in the death of you or a loved one than it is to result in the death of, uh, of a criminal. And it's, it's something based upon uh, academic research, but it's really poorly done research, and I wish the media, when they bring this up, would at least acknowledge some of the problems. So I'll just give you a couple of problems. One is, um, when you look at this, uh, the first study, they're all pretty much the same, looked at 444 homicides. They would look at people who died in or near a home, and they asked the relatives of the deceased whether or not that a gun was owned in the home. Yes. And if a gun was owned in a home and somebody died from a gunshot, then they would just assume that that gun that was owned in the home was the one that caused the death. In fact, when uh, other researchers have looked at the data, they found that um, 436 of those 444 homicides were actually due to weapons being brought in outside the home, and that it was simply a mistake to go and assume that all the deaths were due to the gun that was in the home. In fact, virtually all of them were due to a weapon being brought in from the outside. Another problem with it is that they only assume a benefit when you go and kill the criminal. Uh, the problem is, is that, um, you know, fewer than one out of every thousand times that a gun's used defensively is the criminal uh, killed. Uh, the vast majority of times just simply brandishing a gun is sufficient to go and cause a criminal to break off an attack. And Amazing. that's assuming no benefit from getting the criminal to run away. You know, that's a big <laughs> benefit often for people. When they when um, they assume things like this, they know that uh, they assume that the gun in the home was the one that caused the killing or, you know, killed the person. Is that with an intent to deceive the people? Why would they do that? Let yeah, me take a it. let me take a break and I'll let you respond to that when we come back. 888-775-3773. Dr. John Lott is with me back in a moment.
Okay, folks, I'm trying to uh, explain or understand what's going on here, taking away our right to protect ourselves. Dr. John Lott is with me, and he's helping me to understand even more so. Dr. Lott, I asked when they would say, when they assume it was the gun in the home that caused the problem, what that was that with the intent to deceive, or they just didn't what? Uh, you know, I can't get in somebody's mind on these types of things. I can just tell you the problems are not with the research that others have found. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty clear uh, that if you just assume, I mean, that if somebody dies from the home and a gun was owned in the home there, that uh, that's a big assumption. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and people have gone back and checked it and what they found. So there's big holes there. Uh, the media, if they're going to go and cite the original research, you would think that they would go and have some responsibility to cite uh, the follow-up research to yeah. check that. I yeah. mean, that's often what happens in academia. I've been an academic most of my life. That, um, you know, uh, initial studies have problems with them, and uh, hopefully uh, if there are problems, uh, people will look at it and fix those issues. Uh, you know, there are other it, problems beyond the two that we just talked about, yeah. uh, kind of logical issues about how the test was set up, too, that we could go into. But You uh, know, you mentioned that in the beginning here, the opening, that uh, black Americans need these neat guns in the inner cities, especially, you know, I can think of Chicago, as you know, but right. most of the uh, inner cities, black Americans need to be able to protect themselves because crime is out of control. I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama, and my great-grandfather uh, ran uh, the plantation for a while. And uh, long story short, there was a black man who was fired from another plantation. My great-grandfather hired him. The uh, white owner of those other plantations didn't, uh, the other plantation didn't want my great-grandfather to hire him, but my great-grandfather said, yes, I'm going to do it anyway. They came for my, my grandfather in the middle of the night, he had his gun under the bed, and he was able to run them off because he had a way to protect himself. himself. And then they came back another night, and my, he went for this gun, and his wife had moved the gun, and they were able to kill him in his bed. And, uh, and so people asked, well, why did you move his gun? Why did you take his gun away? She said, oh, I was trying to protect him. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, how are you going to protect him by removing his gun? And I think people don't really see the need to protect yourself from the criminals. Right. Well, I mean, uh, I was just saying who benefits relatively more, but you're right. I mean, people in lots of areas can benefit from owning a gun. Yeah. Also, people in rural areas uh, have some benefit simply because Police response times are yes. often extremely long in those places. I want to ask you about this because of time, and I'm sorry to rush here. Your book, uh, At the Brink, Will Obama Push Us Over the Edge, uh, what is that about? What do you mean by that? Well, I'm very concerned about the long-term impact and damage that's happened from a lot of Obama's different policies, whether yeah. it be with regard to the quality of health care, whether it be to the how well the economy is doing or many areas such as uh, what's happening to people's ability to go and defend themselves with regard to guns. And so if you just take the health care, you know, in the last four years, we've seen pharmaceutical companies dramatically cut their research budgets uh, and staffs. Uh, companies like Pfizer have seen 50 percent cuts in their research staffs for, for new drugs. Merck's seen a 60 percent cut. You know, you have to be careful when you go and you try regulating a lot of things that companies do because you may alter their incentives for going and developing things. And what's happened in this case is that drugs that otherwise would have been developed, you know, when you have a 50 percent or 60 percent cuts in research staffs, aren't going to be developed. And so drugs that would have saved people's lives or uh, would have improved the quality of people's lives, not just in the United States, but around the world, because 
over the last few decades, the vast majority of new drugs that have been developed have been developed in the United States, aren't going to be developed now. Uh, you look at other things there, too. Look at the cost of uh, medical insurance. During the first two years that Obama's regulations on health insurance were in effect, we averaged almost one percentage point increase in health insurance premium costs per month. And that's a huge increase relative to what health insurance costs have been going up before, and it's going to get even worse. Yeah. So in January, this coming year, when the health care exchanges are going to be set up, uh, the cheapest insurance that you're going to be able to buy the so-called bronze insurance package um, is for an individual is going to be seven thousand one hundred dollars. Wow. The average price right now for insurance for an individual is five thousand four hundred dollars. So just between now and the end of the year, you're going to go from an average of five thousand four hundred to a minimum price of seventy one hundred. Uh, you look at it for a family of four. Uh, next year, the cheapest insurance you're going to be able to buy on these exchanges is going to be a little bit over $20,000. Right now, it's about 14000 for a family of four as an average. So you go from an average of 14000 to a minimum of 20000 That's a huge increase in just that we're going to be seeing in just about eight months. That's amazing. And, uh, you know, it's going to end... Uh, and I'm worried that the way the program has been set up, you're going to see very quickly um, the elimination of private insurance in this country. And um, because the way it's been changed starting beginning next year uh, is you're going to be able to wait until you actually get sick to go and buy insurance. So you could imagine what would happen to the car insurance market if you could wait until you actually got into a car accident to go and buy insurance to get the car fixed. And as soon as the car is fixed, go and drop the insurance. People won't hold insurance for any other time. I mean, you can, you're going to be able to save a large amount of money by just simply waiting till you get sick before you go and buy insurance. Wow. Um, you know, there are lots of concerns I have, but um, I, some of the material that I go through in the book is to try to explain how how good health care has been in the United States. The president is often criticized our system by saying, look at life expectancy. Our life expectancy isn't quite as long as it is in, in a few other countries. But the problem is Americans do lots of risky behavior. We yeah. have, we yeah. have uh, you know, the highest car accident rates in the world. A lot of young people get into car accidents. We have uh, uh, other types of things that are going on in terms of uh, obesity. Americans are much more overweight than people in other countries. Those types of things are beyond what health and health care is able to go and deal with. The CDC uh, is now reporting that there is over 110,000 sexual transmitted disease. Right. And uh, we're dealing with that in America. How are people going to be able to you know, if this is true, and I, I know it to be true, how are people going to be able to afford the insurance to get treated for that? L let me take a quick break, final break here. When I come back, I want you to respond to that and tell the people how to get your book. You've done some excellent research on these issues. Back in a moment. As you can tell, if anyone understands the issue of guns and the right to protect yourself, uh, the uh, economic situation, my guest, Dr. John Lott, understands. He's done some extensive research on, on these and other issues. He has uh, uh, several books that he has written about these and other issues, and I want to make sure that he can tell you how to uh, get those books, all right? The uh, one is his newest book, At the Brink, Will Obama Push Us Over the Edge? He's also written, uh, uh, he's the author of, of More Guns, Less Crime, and, and, and on and on. Uh, Dr. Lott, tell the folks how to, before we run out of time here, tell the folks how to get your books, well, thanks. Uh, well, I suppose uh, 
probably one of the cheapest places to get it is on the web, either at barnesandnoble.com or uh, amazon.com. Uh, but uh, at least the newest book should be available in you know many bookstores like Barnes and Noble, for example. But um, the older books, uh, it's probably easiest to get them on uh, on one of those websites. You know, in reading your bio last night, preparing for the show today, you've done some serious uh, studying and, and uh, investigation into this. You've written about it. How did you come to be so serious about this? Well, uh, I suppose I just kind of backed into uh, the issue, and that is uh, I was teaching at the Wharton Business School at the time, and uh, some students had come up to me after class and asked me if uh, I could go and talk about uh, gun control issues. Uh, I was teaching a class that was dealing with crime generally, and uh it forced me, even though I'd done a lot of research on gun, on crime at the time and had been chief economist at the United States Sentencing Commission, I'd never really been very interested in uh, in the issue of uh, gun control. And it forced me to, to look at the existing literature, and uh, I was just amazed how badly it w- was done. I mean, you yeah. could, uh, you know, I'd been familiar with some of the research, but I hadn't really been interested in the area, but I kind of assumed that there was other good research out there, even though what I'd seen before uh, wasn't very strong. And I was just shocked by how poorly done it was. And one of the reasons why people go and do academic research is uh, in an area is because they think they can do a better job or they have a, a new idea that nobody's thought of before. And, um, you know, in this case, uh, it was. I just thought I could do a better job than people had done previously. And, I think uh, you have. I have to say, I've never seen such um, in-depth research on this issue. Uh, let me just ask this in my final question for you: If you took a random, low-informational person off the street, you know, who who doesn't feel strongly either way about uh, an increase in gun control, what would you tell that person? Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, most people get their information about uh, guns from just listening to the media, where you go and you hear constantly about bad stories, virtually never hear about the benefits. And that gives people a real misconception about the relative costs and benefits of uh, people owning guns. Uh, You know, um, uh, the FBI estimates how many gun crimes are committed each year. They just can't rely on on crimes that are reported to police because not all crimes are reported. Only about half of gun crimes are reported. And so they go and they do a survey to try to figure out what is the actual rate of gun crime. And they estimate right now it's about 350,000 times a year that guns are used in commission of crime. Those same types of surveys are used to try to figure out how often people use guns defensively. And, in fact, those show that people use guns defensively about 2 million times a year. So people are using guns defensively more than five times more frequently each year to stop crime than they are to commit crime. But if you were to ask most people who are simply relying on the media uh, what they consider to be newsworthy to determine, you know, how often these things occur, they think it's even more often the other way. And I think that creates real misimpressions. And I'm not saying the media does it all on purpose. Uh, You know, if you're editor of a news bureau and you have two stories that come across your desk, one case a woman brandishes a gun, would-be attacker runs away, no shots are fired, no dead body on the ground. And as we mentioned before, about 95% or so of the times people use guns defensively, that's all that happens. Amazing. Uh, Versus another case where a dead body's on the ground with a sympathetic person like a victim. Which story are you going to give more news coverage to? I I think anybody would give more news coverage to the second story. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you got to take both into account if you want to answer the question what's safest for people to do. Dr. John Lott, thank you so much for being with me, sir. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much.